Why? What justifications do you 
could possibly have to treat another human being like this. Well, one, uh, one is a, is, is, a, is a distortion of scripture. Um, it's, called, it's called polygenesis. So this, so this understanding that, uh, that God kind of creates different, different types of people. So there's some who are descended from Adam, others who are descended from others. This was this was largely this was this was largely debunked kind of soon soon after it gained soon after it gained prominence. But there were other ways to justify general African inferiority, whether mental, moral, or civil. And all those essentially made up ideas were used to justify the continuation of these of these practices. I mentioned in the in the sermon this morning, um, and will and will again the Maryland slave law in 1664 where the Maryland General Assembly passes this law that says that slaves are to be slaves for the rest of their lives, and your slave status is to be determined by your mother. Why? Because if a, because if a, because if a, if a slaveholder sexually assaults their, their female slave, something that happened often, the fruit of that, the fruit of that union was to be enslaved as well. And so you have, you have, you have more ways of perpetuating this system. Enshrined in law. Scripturally, people will refer back to the curse of Ham in Genesis 9. Uh, in, this, in, this, in this text, Ham, Ham isn't even cursed in the, in the text, specifically Canaan is. But in a very, in a very, very old, a very old interpretation of scripture that actually goes back to uh, Jewish and, 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 and medieval and Reformation and, and early modern Christian interpretations of Genesis 9, the curse, the curse of Ham. Is the curse it, it is the curse of blackness and the curse of perpetual slavery, and so the argument is, descendants of Ham are cursed to perpetual slavery, as one of the as one of the justifications of the system in this country. We'll also go back to the mark the mark of Cain once again, not in the text at all that the mark of Cain is a mark of blackness. As a matter of fact, when you look at that text, it's a mark of protection. Where God, where God is saying, look, when people, when people see this mark on you, Cain, no one will kill you. But, once again, when, 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 there is a, when, there's, when there's a system that benefits folks that you can't really find justification for, the willingness of human beings to kind of, to, to, to shape things to their own benefit, it knows no doubt. And the scriptures have been, have been used as a tool in that, in that, in that endeavor. So, What's most important, I think, about this history, though, is, is, the, is the modes of black Christian resistance. It's Richard Allen, founder of the, founder of the, of the AME Church, Frederick Douglass, and we have an example of a slave rebellion. So one of the ways in which this happens is through independent African churches. The reason why predominantly black denominations exist is because in many of these churches, especially, especially following the Civil War, you have, you have black members of these churches who come to their leadership and say, hey, our worship is being actively restricted. Us being kept to particular portions of the room or being relegated to the balcony and things like that, like we're, our, our worship is, is being restricted. So can we, can we go somewhere else and start our own, and start our own church? The response of that leadership was, was rarely, if ever, oh, we're restricting your worship? It seems to me that we should respond in repentance and thus be able to worship together. Instead, the response was, oh, yeah, 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 go over there, do your, do your own thing. It would, it would actually be much easier that way. And, uh, we'll send somebody to, like, make sure that you're not fomenting rebellion, but go, go do your thing over there. Thus, we have the founding of independent African churches, in, including many black Baptist organizations and the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion. So one method of resistance is to build your own church. Frederick Douglass, uh, in his, in his, um, in his, through, through his autobiographies and also through his political activism, resisted, resisted slavery in his own way. And you also have folks like, like David Walker. So David Walker is perhaps the most important, yeah, just the most important abolitionist in America. I'm gonna, I'll just, I'll, I'll throw it, I'll throw it out there. Um, in 1830, he writes a, he writes a book called uh, An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. After, after reading this book, so, so up until, up until this point, 
when, when many abolitionists address, address slavery, they often did so in a gradual, in a gradual way. They were what could be known as radicals. The idea is, hey, slavery's bad, but if you get rid of it now, that will lead to societal collapse, and we're not really ready for that right now, so, so, so however we can kind of slowly phase it out, that will be great. David Walker had none of that. So in this, in, in this text, which I, I suggest all of you, all of you read it, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful text. Um, but in it, he, he lays out not only the evils of slavery, but also the necessity of doing away with it now. After reading this book, um, there were there were there were governors. So he so he so so, so he even had a uh, a distribution system among among uh, among slave communities because he, he he wrote it to be read out out loud. Um, and there are and there and there are governors of coastal states who who we have letters from them saying, hey, we need to ban, we need to ban this book. If anybody if any, if anybody gets it, like we're gonna have Because of this text, that a number of these abolitionists, which, is, which are already a small group, but a number of them, after reading this text, are convinced of an immediatist approach to abolition. That this is not something that can go away gradually. It's got to go away now. Yeah. 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 If you, if you Google David, uh, David Walker, this is this is his book. It's called An Appeal to the Colored Citizens. And so you have David Walker's, you have David Walker's resistance, and you have slave revolts. Denmark Vesey and and Nat Turner uh, are two of the most are two of the most famous ones. Matter of fact, the um, the, the the Nat Turner revolt happens uh, the year after David Walker writes that text. So, with the Civil War, we have abolition, sort of. Um, W. E. Du Bois has a great has a great quote about um, about abolition and the years and the years after. Uh, you have the Emancipation Proclamation in, in 1863, but full but full emancipation doesn't actually happen until the until uh, until the 13th Amendment. But even after the 13th Amendment, you have that 12 year period of Reconstruction from 1865 to 1877. 12 years of an actual focused political and legal work to establish the freedom of newly freed slaves. And yet, at the end of that period, W.B. Du Bois would say that the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back again towards slavery. For slavery, for the Civil War, emancipation, radical reconstruction, that is this period of 12 years from 1865 to 1877. Black redemption, and then what's called white redemption after 1877. So after, the, after, after what's called the Great Compromise, and President Rutherford Hayes tells, tells essentially Southern, uh, Southern, Southern legislators, hey, um, so I know we've got, we've got federal troops in the South um, uh, enforcing, enforcing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. I know that like, that's, that's inconvenient for you. So I'll pull the troops out if you throw in votes for me. So they throw in those votes. He pulls out those troops, and, and a number of these, especially white paramilitary groups, begin to start, begin to start regaining power. It's in that period that we see the rise of lynching. Between 1880 and 1940, roughly, you have upwards of 4,000 black men, women, and children who are killed, who are killed by mobs. The image that is often in our minds is the image of the rope. On average, once a week. But people are hanged, burned alive, riddled with bullets, sexually assaulted. A few examples. One is the example of Jesse Washington here, here in here in here in Waco in 1916. And then and, and, and Jesse Washington's lynching actually actually um, actually jump started the NAACP's anti-lynching. But even, but even before then, but even, but even before then, there were multiple, there were multiple other, multiple, multiple other lynchings. I think particularly um, of folks like Sam Hose in 1899 in Noonan, in, in Georgia, burned alive in front of a group of thousands of people. Mary Turner is perhaps uh, the 
most the most harrowing of these of these of these narrators. Um, there there is a so basically a a a, a sharecropper sharecropper is killed by one of by one of his by, by one of his workers, and a mob and a mob gathers to find mob gathers to find the murderer. As this mob goes to the town, they just indiscriminately kill black men. Upwards of 12 or 13 men are killed. One of these men is Mary Turner's husband, Hayes Turner. So Mary Turner, uh, she, she, she says rather loudly that she's going to seek the that she's going to seek the prosecution of those who killed her husband. Newspapers would later report that those were unwise words. The mob came after her. When they found her, they, 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 they strung her up by her ankles, doused her, doused her in gasoline, and burned her alive. She was also eight months pregnant. So they cut the baby out of her and stopped the baby to death. They left a, they, they, they buried her in a shallow grave with a bottle of whiskey and a cigar in the top of that bottle of whiskey. If you are squeamish, do not look at the screens. What you're about to see is a postcard. Postcards would, 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 would circulate uh, following the lynching. In this one, this guy sends it to his father. Probably can't read the text, but it says, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the left with a cross over it, your son Joe. My, my, my research is on churches responding to this, to this phenomenon. Because my assumption is that if, especially if this is going on for decades, as human beings, you can't, you, 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 you must, <laughs> You, you must affirm your dignity in a society that refuses it to you. And because churches are the most powerful institutions in black communities at this, at this time particularly, my expectation was I'll find answers in churches. And so you find, you find a range of these responses from folks who are saying, hey, if we, if we pray about it, then lynching will stop, all the way to folks who are saying, You're going to, we're going to need to arm ourselves in self-defense. I think particularly of the lynching in, uh, in Delaware, it's, it's, it's actually precipitated by a Presbyterian minister. A man is a man is in a, a man is in jail, having been arrested for for raping and killing a white woman. And this guy and, and this and this man gets I guess in front of his congregation and he says, "If it, he, he's he, he's also speaking to the he's also speaking to the jury, kind of in his mind. He says, "If if you're not quick to convict this guy, he ought to be lynched." The next day, he's dragged out of jail and lynched. And so then the following Sunday, Montrose Thornton, an AME, an, an, AME, an, an AME minister, gets before his congregation and he says, if a mob is after you, you're probably not going to survive. And so he says, and I quote, your best option may be to die in your tracks, perhaps drinking the blood of your pursuers. On one side, you may have those who are saying, Pray about it. This will stop. All the way to dying in the tracks of half drinking the blood of your pursuers. And there are numerous, there are numerous spots in between. There are folks who uh, there, there, are, uh, uh, there are folks who thought that education was the way forward. There are folks who thought particular types of political activism were the way forward. Um, but that but there's a but there's a wide range of resistance to this to this phenomenon over the course over the course of the Kidnapped him in the middle of the night, 
and he's never seen again. Until a few days later, until a few days later, when his body shows up in a nearby river with a cotton gin tied up, tied up, tied around his neck, laying down. When, when, when they had this funeral, his mother insisted that that he have an open casket so that they could see what these what these men had done to her boy. That's what his face looked like. This was what this was this this was essentially what what sparked the civil what sparked the civil rights movement. This history of racial violence is something is something that continues that we that we continue to kind of bear the weight of even today. Want, want to be a multi-ethnic church. Um, but at, 
least at least what I have to tell a number of predominantly excuse me, a number a number of predominantly white churches is that your like your church may never be a multi-ethnic church. It's just kind of the way the way some of these things work. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you don't invest with partner that, that you don't invest in partnerships with, with other with other churches. Because the fact of the matter is, is that that's one of the that's one of the ways that we can also be a beacon to the world of the kind of unity that Christ that, that Christ prayed for us in John in John 17. So it may not be it may not be in your in your particular local body, but you can build relationships with other folks. It also comes to the way that you think about so one 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 kind of uh, one one concrete way when we think of the way that we exercise particularly the political power. Consider, have your first consideration, how will this affect the marginalized in, 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 in our midst? How will this affect the poor? How will this affect the immigrant? Oh, well, well, any, any of these categories. Our first, often for all of us, our first priority is ourselves. How is this going to benefit me and my family? And that's, and that's often what dictates a lot of our action beyond kind of our just kind of personal personal. But, but I'm deeply convinced that the gospel is, is a personal message, a communal message, and a cosmic message. And so, and, and so it has to be applied in every single one of those spheres. And so that includes, that includes our political engagement. So it includes us thinking through, okay, how, 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 can I, how can I use the opportunities that the Lord has given me for the benefit of those who don't, who don't, who don't have those same opportunities? When that becomes a primary, when that becomes a primary driver of our action, then we also start to get, then we also start to get a glimpse of what it is for us to have the mind among ourselves, which is, which is ours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't see equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. The, one of the one of the one of the explicit ways that we can do that is by recognizing every day as an opportunity. To exhibit that, to exhibit that mind. And so that so that applies, it applies, it applies in a racialized society, it applies when it, it applies when we go to work, it applies when we go to church, it applies in each and every one of those spheres. Now the now the specifics of what that of what that of what that means for you, one of the um, I did a um, I did a, uh, a kind of webinar for for Truett uh, that I titled um, it was uh, racial racial healing as pastoral care. Part of it is to have actually this expectation of those who are in pastoral care of you. That, that the expectation is, okay, what does, what does the application of the gospel look like in this, in this sphere? Because the fact of the matter is that I think, I think that's fundamentally what the work of pastoral care is. It's equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That is, equipping the saints to actually apply the gospel in, in every single sphere of their lives. Um, and so those are, those are some... Those are some, some, I think, big picture, big picture thoughts. Uh, they may, they may apply to each of you differently, depending on the situation that you find yourself in. Um, but those are some big picture thoughts. If that's helpful. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Our, our duty is to is to engage in all in all lawful endeavor 
years to preserve the lives of ourselves, of ourselves and of our and of our neighbors. And so it's important for us to remember that it's not just enough not to kill one another, because we're called to love one another, which means to actively support one another's lives. And so the fact of the matter is, is that in the relationships in which you find in which you find yourselves, healing is going to mean something different for the people that you come into contact with. But healing has to be the priority. So it's not just it's not just kind of understanding on your on your part. The fact of the matter is, is that this history is actually traumatizing for all of us. Racism hurts all of us. Um, and so there's a sense in which there's a, there's, a, there's a healing that we all have to undergo. But in order to do that, you have to, I mean, we have to be clear about the wounds, not only that we, not only that we have, that we've suffered, but also the wounds that we may have knowingly or unknowingly inflicted. And so, and so it begins, it begins with, really it begins with self-assessment. My three kind of, my three kind of R, R words are uh, reckoning, repentance, and reconciliation. And so it, so it begins with, it begins with reckoning with this history and reckoning with your, reckoning with your place in it, continues in, re, in repentance. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, we get, we get from, uh, from, from Nehemiah 1 and 2 that it's not just that, that repentance extends not, not only personally, but you can actually confess corporately, even for, even for your ancestors. Um, it's, an, it, it's an example that we see that we see in, uh, in, the, uh, in Nehemiah, but then that but then that moves into the intentional work of, re, of reconciling with your or with your neighbors. It begins with getting to know them, but part of but part of that work is is understanding, um, like I said, where are where 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 are their wounds? Is there a way that I can invest in your in your healing? When that becomes what we as the body of Christ are known for. As opposed to whatever it is that we're known for in society now, <laughs> if that if that then if that then becomes what we're known for, I think that's good news. I think that's good news for the spread of the gospel. Good. I have some, I have some issues with it, but 
the history, the history text that he uh, stamped from the beginning is great. I mean, it's 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 horrific to read, but it's a but it's a it's it's a wonderful text. That's that's Ibram Ibram Kendi I B R A M Kendi K E N D I. The book is called Stamped from the Beginning. The subtitle is The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, uh, which is that's a very ambitious subtitle. <laughs> But um, but I'll but I'll but I'll give you this and then I'll and then I, and then and then, and then, and then, and then I'm gonna wrap up. His one of the insights that you get from the introduction of his of his book is um, he talks about kind of why why we are so resistant to being called racist. And he says that it's because when we think racist, we think ignorant and hateful. And so the way that we think that this process goes is that it goes okay, you got. Uh, That's how we think it, that the process goes. But when you trace it historically, it, it, it works in the opposite direction. So things begin in self-interest. You want to do things that benefit you. And so you find, so, so and I narrated this with the, oh, 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 with the, with the incident with the Portuguese. Then you start, then, then, then people start kind of enacting policies that end up, that end up disproportionately affecting particular folks. Then you, then you, then you formulate ideas to justify that particular state of affairs. Then those ideas start to circulate. They start to build a mind of their own. And that's when this ignorance and hate starts to build. Because these, because, pe because people then think that these ideas are just ideas that popped out of nowhere when they were really ideas to justify a particular state of affairs. And so then we end up in the spot that we're in now. Once we begin to see that that's actually how a number of these ideas play out, that a number of, of, these, of, 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 of these ideas that are fundamentally untrue about the that they serve that they serve a purpose for other people. Once we once we start to see that, then we also start to then, then we can also start to see the ways that we can start to dismantle those kinds of things. Um, but that's one of the things that he, he he lays that out throughout this entire book. I mean, he goes through the fact that you know the um, the, the, the the founder of uh, of gynecology. Um, most of his most of his discoveries came came from experimenting on uh, on enslaved on, on enslaved black women. Um, that uh, I mean, you 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 have got medical advancements, social political advancements, a number of uh, a, a number of things happen kind of on the on the basis of racist ideas. It's a uh, it's a harrowing read, but a, but a very but a very important one. Thank you all for your time, for your attention. Um,